Hello everyone and welcome back to Imperator Rome. Uh, I'm Lord Foreman here with a country guide, this time for Judea. So for those of you who've watched my civilized, uh, civilized economy guide know that I have a great fondness for Judea, mainly due to the Prophet Moses giving one free provincial investment. But anyway, I decided to do a country guide on them. So we'll reiterate what kind of went over in the economy guide and then we'll talk about how I've managed to expand to here without fighting a war. So, um, Judea starts off just down here, the area around Jerusalem, uh, Jericho and stuff. You start out as a subject of the Antigonids who tend to get killed, at which point your tributary status will flip to Egypt. And uh, obviously you want to stay as a tributary as long as possible because it means almost no one's likely to attack you, especially when you're sitting between both the Seleucids and the Ptolemies of Egypt. Um, so, uh, the big thing about Judea is you won't get attacked. Um, Egypt usually gets this land in a peace deal. Obviously, I have expanded up this way. And uh, you want to take the Prophet Moses as your omen periodically. You get one free province invest it. You want to stick it in your capital. You'll see I'm not very far into the game and I've already got a fair amount of trade routes going. Six investments there. Uh, the other prophets you want to have probably up are probably David for the citizen output, Solomon for if you invoke him, you embellish your second temple, you get population, capacity, happiness, and tax in Jerusalem. Since tax isn't as useful as it was, it's not it's not absolutely amazing. It's pretty useful, and you probably want to put up Abraham here for the population growth over Esther, which is conversion speed. Conversion speed is useful. Um, I might sw swap back to Esther pretty soon. Um, I wasn't able to expand for the first 20 years because the uh, the Egyptian governor of these lands was content and a loyalist, so I couldn't expand. So, <clears throat> um, basically for the start of the game, you want to make sure you go and you put as many academies in your starting three cities as you can. Work on probably making a another city somewhere else. Um, getting trade routes in your three starting provinces, one of which is just one territory. Automating trade, blocking surplus, um, procking the Moses Omen multiple times. The other thing you want to do is you want to raise your levies, wait for so months, and then disband them to increase your military experience. It's a wonderful little exploit someone taught me. Um, the other things you want to do is you want to grab... Um, work your way towards prescribed canon through the religious tree when you can. Um, you want to try and get uh, up your research efficiency because you're gonna you're a small nation. You're gonna play rather tall for a while. So more research efficiency, more techs, more innovations you get. Um, what I started doing was I started down the civic tree here, grabbed a couple of the commerce incomes, swapped my stance to mercantile, and then I realized, well. I'm kind of just sitting here. Um, since I'm going to take land, I might as well grab some conversion. So I'll probably stick three more into prescribed canon to get the conversion laws unlocked, at probably at which point I'll put on religious. Sadly, uh, Judean heritage has a penalty to conversion speed that the uh, conversion religious conversion law barely overcomes um, percent-wise. It gets 5% more, but it's the biggest, the pop conversion speed plus 0.25 is huge. Um, hilariously, even though um, I have enough territories to become a regional power, I'm not going to become a regional power until I actually conquer a province. The game seems a bit bugged the way I'm gaining land. So, anyway, let's move into how I got the land. So, Diplomacy in Imperator Rome is so much better than any of the other Paradox games, in my opinion, because you can actually get subjects and have tr subject troubles based off loyalty and opinion, unlike most of the other games. For example, EU4, you get a subject, the odds are your subject's never going to rebel on you. So, um, however, diplomacy can also be used through almost an espionage, personal diplomacy. For example, if I was to go up here and click on this guy, this guy has 55 loyalty to the Seleucid government. He's the governor of Syria, so he controls quite a bit of area. And I can, in fact, bribe him with this entice governor 
to join my side at the cost of 20 aggressive expansion and negative 50 opinion on the Seleucids. Thankfully, I have Egypt protecting me right now. Um, obviously, you want to be careful how you do it. I've done it to Egypt once, and they get the 50 penalty too. You don't want that to go negative. The other thing you also don't want to do is ever go negative income because it will break your tributary status with Egypt instantly. And um, you basically wait and sit around sniping off governors. Um, the easiest way to do it is make someone your friend. As you can see, has foreign rulers friend is a negative five loyalty. And then if you inspire loyalty, it's negative 20 loyalty as well. So you can get anybody who's 65 or lower, you can basically entice to your side. Um, the key things to realize is you can only do inspire disloyalty every couple years. And if you want to um, have, an, you have to basically make your ruler a friend. Um, and that's basically how it goes. So what you have to do is periodically you have to like remove friends. Um, it costs you political influence. You just gotta, you basically usually want to make him a friend. You don't always have to. Um, in this case, I can just inspire disloyalty. Um, and then if they were a friend, I would be able to entice them. You do have to have them as friends. You'll see what happened is this guy immediately got taken out of office. Um, the AI recognizes when they fall to lol, and they immediately cause them to leave the government. So, and I can't stop inspiring disloyalty for two years. So I messed up saying it earlier. Basically, you want to make them your friend first before you in inspire the disloyalty because you need the friendship and the loyalty to get them to flip to your side. Um, you don't even have to pay them money. They just defect. The only thing to watch out for is obviously aggressive expansion and the opinion. Um, I did another Judea game. This one I just created for you guys to show the concept. Um, I managed to steal all of this from Egypt and the Seleucids um, without ever fighting a war. I think I had, I had almost the equivalent population of Egypt after sniping all of their non-capital lands. Basically, you can bribe any governor that's not a capital region. So unfortunately, you can't bribe your way into Egypt itself or Babylon. Um, but what you can do is you can steal all their outlying territory through basic bribery. It's unbelievably funny and a bit broken at the moment. I suspect it will be patched. Um, unfortunately, there's no way to steal other subjects of your overlord's lands that I found. Um, you can try doing like a subject transfer, but you'd have to be super strong. Um, you can't launch wars as a tributary, which puts you in a the stance that you can only expand through bribing governors, basically. You could try and play tall, but there's no real point. As you can see, we're making quite a bit of money, paying quite a bit in tributes, but overall, we're safe. The Seleucids are not about to attack the Egyptians to kill us. Um, we've got enough money we could raise troops. Um, we could hire mercenaries. And as you see, I've already started to get down the traditions. As Egypt, you want to start down the Levantine, Levantine Kingdoms tradition. Desert Sands, good reputation. The big ones are Legacy of the Builders, four pre free investments, plus one global city building slots. Really good. The Holy Site's nice as well. The big one down here is Cradle of Civilization, plus five civilization, 10 manpower, but more importantly, four free innovations. Um, and then further down, Unending Riches will give you the loyalty of governors, all of which will be very useful. And then if you go down the other branch of this tree, you'll get Colonial Integration. You'll get, you know, colonies put out and you can build them and it'll make cities cheaper and at the end you get another fort infrastructure um are you sorry you get a fort infrastructure um that applies to your whole nation which will be very useful when you expand beyond that if you're going to use camels and sh horses you go this way otherwise you want to flip flip to the maritime traditions snag this one pretty much anytime gives you extra import routes in your cities which is useful and then you basically want to go down the whether you're going to use light or heavy infantry determines which tree of these you go down um, sadly they don't have unbelievable combat like some of the greek or the roman ones you want to try and snag uh, a flip to either the greeks or um, another tradition as soon as you can just for more military stuff you obviously, in order to flip to it, you have to embrace different cultures, and it doesn't go in a straight line. You can do like Afro, 
Um, you can do Levantine Greek, but you have to have 45 Greek culture, which if you're expanding like I am, you'll get it. So Greek warfare, Merchant Coast. Then if you have 80, obviously, military experience, you flip with an integrated culture, and then you unlock the Greek trees, and you continue down those, because those have better benefits. The other stuff to consider is going for mercenary armies. Um, you do get a mer um, maintenance discount there. If you go down the Greek tree, you can get a hiring one. Um, let's see, where else is there? I think there's another one where you can make... Um, might be under the traditions. There's another one where you get, yeah, mercenary maintenance cheaper here as well. So you could stack that, be able to fund and maintain a large amount of mercenaries. Uh, the issue is you have to um, obviously embrace Persian influence, um, which isn't actually overwhelmingly that hard because Aramaic culture here counts as Persian. Um, it's part of this whole group here. So you're going to get some just expanding as Judea. So you can unlock that tradition pretty quickly as well. Um, get the heavy maintenance, and then if you want, you can flip over to the Persian tree. Basically, you want to try and flip the trees and grab what you think would be the best stuff. Hills, attrition, combat bonus, siege ability. There's lots of little things you want to pick off. I recommend trying to prioritize stuff that gets you um, forts, um, levy size, or um, like mercenary maintenance and stuff. So like some of the Persian trees give you forts, levies, combat, morale legitimacy the persian rural traditions are very strong and obviously some of the other ones like cavalry skirmish under persian royal also gives you innovations the goal is basically get as many innovations as possible keep improving relations with your overlord stealing as much land as you want get it all nicely converted of your culture and stable before you backstab your overlord and take all their lands um it's not really that hard to go for the egyptian achievements um if, we sh if I show you what the achievements are here, um, I still haven't done it. I got pretty close before I stopped. Um, let's see, where is it? Holy Pilgrim, own all the Jewish holy sites. Um, you start out with a couple of them. You pick up more as you go. Um, there's where some of them are. Um, there's other ones down here. Um, Moses has a holy site down here as well. Um, you just got to go through and go, okay, we're going to expand, take this holy site and worry about it. Thankfully, most of your holy sites are north of you. Um, it's not really that hard to get this achievement. It's more the start that's the hard part. Um, once you get a good start, it's not very hard to pick up the remaining ones. You, you start out with two, you need six. You get some by conquering Samaria as well. And overall, not particularly hard. Uh, it's a fun country to play. You can play tall, you can get very developed, and then you can go absolutely nuts with your tech superiority and your mercenaries to basically replace the successor kingdoms. You don't have, unfortunately, any unique decisions um, other than imperial ambition. You cannot recreate the um, Hellenic Empire. There's not even a way to really like create uh, the Jewish larger empire under Solomon and David. So... That's disappointing, but the solution is enticing governors, make them your friend, then make sure their provincial loyalty is below 50 and their loyalty is below, falls below 40 when you start inspiring disloyalty, get them to join your side, improve relations, let AE tick down, and then repeat. The AI is not smart enough to realize you're doing this. This can be done as other countries to steal land, but it's particularly fun to do as Judea or Samaria. So hopefully you guys have enjoyed a very quick look into Judea and how to play them. Uh, they're fun. They've got a unique tradition. They've got a very unique religion that's, despite it saying that you're not very good at conversion, the fact is Judea is good at conversion because uh, they have de they count as deified rulers. Um, it's quite amusing. So have fun. Convert people. Be the one monotheistic faith in the game at this time. And overall, just have fun um, bribing your way to power. This is really the country to uh, have fun doing it works as smaller nations but it's pretty fun as judea thank you guys all for watching hopefully you enjoyed this look in judea and i'll see you all another time bye for now